Uh, my name is Yannick Tona. I'm from Rwanda. Uh, it was great to have a wonderful audience to have a young people. I believe young people, we have a power uh, to make a different society and we should use the tools we have, you know, social media and technology and everything we have to make a different society. So we're the next leaders, the next heroes of our society, in our community, and we should use that and just simple thing, just one choice, and your choice can make a difference in people's lives. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to that group, for, and thank you for everyone for cooperating with the seating. We have a full house today, and we do know that there will be schools that will uh, be coming late for buses, so I appreciate your helping by taking every seat and moving in as close as you can. So I am Dale Daniels, and I am the Executive Director of CHANGE, the Center for Holocaust, Human Rights, and Genocide Education here at Brookdale Community College. It is wonderful to see you all here today. Our name is long, but it speaks to the essence of our mission, the Holocaust, human rights, and genocide education, as does our acronym, CHANGE, and that's CHANGE with two H's. CHANGE is at the heart of everything we do, and our goal is to educate you, inspire you, and empower you to work with us to improve our world. We want you to be a partner with us in change. I just want to be sure, can everybody hear me okay? If you can't at any point in time, just wave your hands, okay? Let me know. So thank you for joining us today to listen, to learn, and respond as we mark the 20th anniversary of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. It was from April to July of 1994 that neighbor turned against neighbor and they transformed the land of a thousand hills into miles of violence. In 100 days, more than 800,000 men, women, and children were murdered, mostly by machete. Countless women were raped. And pleas for help to stop that genocide went unanswered. For 100 days, the world watched and was silent. Yeah, the world was silent, but we knew what was happening. Leaders around the world knew. The President of the United States, President Clinton knew. The United Nations knew. We all knew, because Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire provided the United Nations with information about the planned genocide. As the commander of the United Nations Assistance Mission in Rwanda, he witnessed the violence unfold and repeatedly asked for assistance. Not only did the United Nations deny him permission to intervene, but the United Nations withdrew its peacekeeping forces. But General Dallaire, along with a smaller force of African soldiers and 11 Canadians, stayed when everyone else left. They disobeyed the command to withdraw, and they remained in Rwanda to fulfill their ethical obligation, their ethical obligation to protect those who sought refuge with United Nations forces. In doing so, they became rescuers, eyewitnesses, and victims themselves by virtue of witnessing the atrocities. Today, in a little while, we will have the honor to hear from my hero, and the hero of so many, and so many in this room, General Dallaire. Today, we are also honored to welcome the survivors of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, who share their experiences with us. Jacqueline Nyurgitate, Eugenie Mukishimana, Desiree Karangwa, and Yannick Tona are brave individuals. 
They recognized the urgency of conveying their experiences during the genocide and sharing their testimony. They are following in the footsteps of Holocaust survivors, Armenian genocide survivors, and survivors of other mass atrocities. My heartfelt thanks to you, to all the survivors of these mass atrocities who endure the memories and the pain each time they speak, knowing that their personal history has the capacity to change the lives of others. I ask that all the survivors in the room today, those from Rwanda, those from who s survived the Holocaust, I know we have a Cambodian survivor in the room, we have a lost boy from Suzanne, Sudan as well. If you would all stand for a moment so we could honor you. Today, we want to recognize three very important leaders in our community who understood the power of each individual to make a difference in our world. Tomorrow is the 35th anniversary of the founding of Change, our center. It's the 35th anniversary. Our founders, Dr. Seymour Siegler, Professor Jack Needle, and Dean Norma Klein, a blessed memory. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Needle is away today, but we are honored to have Cy Siegler with us here this morning. Cy, we thank you for your vision, your compassion, and your leadership, and we are honored to continue to carry your work forward. This colloquium happens thanks to the assistance of many. First, to all of the teachers and the administrators here today. You are facing many challenges in your classrooms, not the least of which are finding funding and time to participate in field trips and events like today. But you recognize the invaluable opportunity you are offering your students to meet a leader and a hero like General Dallaire up close and personal. Thank you for your dedication. The scrolling slides on the screen acknowledge the sponsors of today's event and of our affiliated art installation, 100 Days of Silence. Our thanks to Provident Bank Foundation, the Hollander family, Weiser's Mazer, and NJEA for their support. And a word about the 100 Days of, art, of Silence art installation, which is located at Change's facility. We are thankful for the dynamic educators in our community who engaged over 450 local middle and high school students with extensive learning about Rwanda. These student, students took these lessons to their minds and their hearts, and they bare their souls to us in their work. Please visit the center today. Don't miss seeing these incredible expressions. And finally, I want to thank the many people who have patiently worked to bring this program to fruition. The staff of Change, including our Director of Education, Jane Denny, our Brookdale Community College faculty, Liaison Debbie Mura, Assistant to the Director, Cynthia Gruskis, our Program Coordinator, Deborah Degnan, the Center's Board of Directors, led by Howard Dorman, Marie Lucia Woodruff of Business Community and Community Development, President Dr. Maureen Murphy and the many varied staff of Brookdale Community College who have assisted with facilities, technology, scheduling, and a myriad of other tasks. And most important of all, the more than 100 center volunteers who work throughout the year. So please join me in showing them our support and thanking them with a warm As you can see, it takes a village to pull together a day like this for you, or at least the very good fortune to be part of a community college like Brookdale. 
So now it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce the president of Brookdale Community College, Dr. Maureen Murphy. Thank you, Dale. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Brookdale Community College. This colloquium is something of which we are very proud. We're happy to have all of you here. As Dale mentioned earlier, the mission of change is driving the programming, but the mission of the college is what provides the venue. Our mission is to provide open access learning opportunities for all of our communities. And so we are delighted to have you here to have this opportunity to learn, to learn deeply, and to take it from here to make the world a better place. We're grateful for your participation. We're grateful for our partners in the school districts who have prepared all these students. And we're grateful for the community members who are here today to share this experience. So again, I welcome you. And I know that this day will be something that you will remember for a very long time. Thank you. Mwaramutse, good morning. I am greeting you in the language of Rwanda, which is Kenya Rwanda. My name is Jane Denny. I'm the Director of Education here at Change, and also the very proud teacher of the seventh and eighth grade of the Rumson Country Day School who's here today. I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing our first distinguished speech speaker today. Working in the field of global atrocities, one would imagine that there is little joy or inspiration, but I have found the opposite to be true. The heroes and heroines of this difficult world are the survivors who are a constant source of admiration and strength. Their courage and resilience provide inspiration for us all as we strive to attain our best in situations that may be challenging to us, but bear no resemblance or equivalency to the horror that they have endured. Their capacity to live, learn, and love again provide us with a model of exemplary human achievement that should be the focus of our lives as we attempt to leave this world a better place, an obligation that we should all embrace. Yannick Tona is such a man. His warmth, sincerity, and compassion belie a past that exposed him to humanity at its worst. Yet from these atrocities, he found a mission, a calling that compels him to empower young people to build a world that has the capacity to erase the hate and violence from its future. He is dedicated to providing youth with the education, leadership, and tools to become dynamic agents of change who will fight to eradicate poverty, hunger, educational inequality, disease, and environmental degradation, all of which contribute to the persistence of genocide and human rights crises in our world today. As a child of Africa, he represents a demographic of youth that is unparalleled anywhere else in the world, yet knows that these young people are the most vulnerable, least represented, and most overlooked in national development agendas. Thus, his goal of raising awareness and teaching advocacy is critical to addressing the issues which prevent global equality. Yannick has just completed his final exams for his freshman year at Texas Christian University, where he majors in political science. This path will help him pave the way for engaging youth in a global conversation that will change the way politics have responded to foreign policy development and implementation. In addition to his studies, Yannick works with the Aegis Trust in Rwanda, which operates the Kigali Genocide Memorials. He speaks to audiences around the world and has already created important partnerships with organizations and leaders who share his vision for the future. He is truly a one-man NGO. My favorite type, title for Yannick is Youth Ambassador for Harmony. I think that best represents the man and his mission. Ladies and gentlemen, my new friend, Yannick Tona.
Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. That was really beautiful right here. Uh, good morning. Is anybody in this building? Good morning. Good morning. Come on, we have students in the building, so I expect you to be loud and say good morning. Good morning. Great, that's better. Uh, grateful to be here. I'm so happy uh, this morning to be joining you guys. Uh, you look great. I wish I'd be wearing jeans like you. I wish I didn't need to wear this. But next time I'm wearing like that, no jeans. Uh, my name is Yannick Tona. I'm from a beautiful country called Rwanda. If you haven't been to Rwanda, you should come, please. It's wonderful. Uh, I've seen some parts of New Jersey that look like Rwanda, you know, the green, the trees. That's my new home. Uh, I'm so grateful to be here this morning, and I want to say, say thank you to the leadership of the center. Thank you very much for having me and for the wonderful work you're doing. Uh, it's, it's, I was at the exhibition last night and see how you know, the work they're doing and transforming the life of young people, and, and it's, it's amazing. The board, uh, members of the board, the founder, and everyone. It's, it's, it's amazing when you see the future leaders of our generation, our countries and communities, when they're getting this education, because this is the next President of the United States, the next Security Council, the next the United Nations. So it's important and wonderful to see they're learning about this when it's in school. So thank you very much for the wonderful work you're doing, and we appreciate that. And also, I want to say thank you to the, uh, my friends from Rwanda, Jacqueline, Nejeli, and the new friend I just made for the wonderful work you're doing, sharing your stories around the world. And uh, I remember growing up, uh, my, my mother. I remember when I was growing up, I wanted to learn more about the genocide and the details. And it was very painful and hard for my mother to speak about it. And when I see uh, our friends come share their stories around the world, it means a lot and it's very important the work you're doing. Thank you very much for the work you're doing. Uh, I want to say thank you to every student who's in this building and everyone. You guys, you are fabulous and you look amazing. And I promise you're going to have a great time and you're going to learn a lot today. So be ready to learn. If you have a pen and paper, you can write too. So <laughs> you're going to learn a lot. So uh, 20 years ago, I had a young brother. Today, I have his bones in a mass grave in the south province of my country where my family used to live. 20 years ago, I had a grandmother and a grandfather Today, I have none of them. 20 years ago, I had uncles. Today, I have one uncle. 20 years ago, I had a home. Today, all I have left are remnants of its foundation surrounded by bushes. 20 years ago, I was a happy four years old, born and raised in a wonderful family, surrounded by family members. Today, I'm a 24 years old young boy, explaining his young brother where is the rest of his family. What's very sad is that I don't have a picture to show him how his young brother used to look like, or his grandparents how they look like. I was born in the south province of Rwanda in a small town called Katagara, just one hour and a half from the capital of my country, Kigali. I was born in a happy, rough family. My dad was a businessman. My mom was a teacher. And I had a sister who was three years old, and a brother who was one year old. I was happy growing up when I was a kid. I was born in this kind of European house. Uh, we had electricity. We had kind of like a European house that most kids at that time, opportunities I have didn't have. But my life changed on 6th April in 1994, when the sun raises my country, it was a normal day. By the end of that day, something will happen, something that will not only change my life, but will change every runner's life. At that evening on 6th April, they shut down the plane that was coming from the president of Rwanda, and the killing and the massacre started and put roadblocks everywhere. When they started, uh, the general started, I was in the south province of Rwanda. What we call province, it's what you call states here. By my country, province are like states. I was in the south with my family. A few days after when the massacre started, 
I was four years old, my sister three years old, and my, ma and my young brother one year old. My mother came telling me, me and my sister, that we're going to my grandmother's house for holidays. My grandma, she lived a few minutes, 20 minutes from where I used to live. But when she told us we're going to my grandma's house for holidays, she was lying to us. Because what happened in the capital in Kigali, and the killing that started around uh, uh, the country, my family had feared that the killing was going to start in our neighborhood. So they decided to go to my grandma's house as a family. So if the killing started, they would be together. So they decided what to do as a family when they're together. But me and my sister, we are very young to be explained that. I'm just four years old and my sister three years old. So my mom told us to go to my grandma's house for holidays, as we used to be, I used to do. I always enjoyed to go to my grandma's house. She was a wonderful woman for the few uh, years I knew her when I was young. One of the reasons I used to like going to her was my grandma lived in a different house I, was, I, I live in. She was living with no electricity, very, uh, she was a farmer. And I remember when I was a kid, I used to fight with her about trying to give me tea with no sugar. And I want sugar. She said, no, I'm not giving sugar. I'm teaching, according to her, she was teaching us tough life. That's her philosophy. And my mom used to fight with her that let my kids have sugar in their tea. And that's a few things I remember about, God, about my grandma. So I always enjoy going to expose that kind of life my, my grandma used to live in. No electricity. So I always enjoyed to go to my grandma's house for holidays. We went to my grandma's house. Uh, we stayed there for a few days. And one day, I was, sit, I was playing outside my grandma's house in the yard. Me, my sister, and my young brother. My, gra my grandmother, my mother, and one of my uncle. They were just sitting next to us talking. And we saw like five, like so many people, 500 or 400 people, so many people just running on the street, just next to my, my grandma's house. For me as a kid, I never saw so many people like that. So for me, it was like a movie. It was like a, something so cool to see. But actually, there's a reason why all these people are running. My uncle was just there. He stand quickly. And he asked one of the guys, why are you running? And the guy replied to my uncle and said, they start killing Tutsis. When he said they start killing Tutsis, I didn't know what Tutsi means, but I know what killing means. My, I've heard about that before in, in the movies and when my grandma used to tell stories. So when he said they start killing Tutsi, I thought Tutsi was an animal, and all these people are running to kill that animal, like kind of type of lion or something. So I thought a Tutsi was an animal, and all these people are running to kill that animal. But something happened. When the guys said they start killing Tutsi, when my mom heard about that, she changed. Her face changed. I saw her face full of fear and confused. But I didn't know what was going on. I was very young, four years old. But I saw something. When they said they start killing Tutsi, my grandma, she grabbed us quickly, me, my sister, my brother, and everyone, my uncle, everyone went inside the house my grandma's house. And they were talking, shouting, talking. And they were talking, what are we gonna do, what are we gonna do? And for me, I didn't care. I didn't know anything was going on. I just see people talking, running around. But I had something very important that years after I remember. I had my grandma, she said, if we go together as a family, if we go as a one group as a family, and they take us, they'll kill us, and that'll be the end of the family. The best way to do this is separate ourselves in two groups, different groups, and go different ways. So they follow my grandma's advice. So they separate in groups. They choose me and my mother to go together. My sister was three years old to go with my uncle. My young brother to go with my grandmother. My grandfather to go with my, one of my uncle. So everyone, the whole family, we divide in two groups. We are between 16 and 20 people, members of my family at that time. So why do they choose me to go with my mother? It's because my mother she's physically handicapped that she needs a cane to walk, which means she cannot carry a child, which means she needs a child who can be able to walk. I was the oldest among my mother's, my mother's children. My sister was three years old. She was the queen, the prince of the house. Don't tell her anything about walking. She was just there. My young brother was one year old, was very young to walk. So they chose me, kind of the oldest and able to walk, to go with my mother. So we were separate in groups and we left. When we left my grandma's house, 
What I thought in my mind was, we're going to the market with my mother, as many times I've done before. So I thought, this time we're going to the market again. But when I left, I didn't know it would be the last time that I saw many members of my family. There are people that I care about so much. I didn't know that there would be no Christmas dinner at my grandma's place. I didn't know that there was just a horrible journey just waiting there outside that would change completely my life forever. We left the house, we started walking. My family had cars, but that time we could not drive because there was roadblocks in every street. So if you drive, they will stop us and kill us. So the only choice we have is not driving, but walking. But not walking in the street again, because walking in the street again, to kill us. But walking in the bush and hide as much as we can. So we start walking, me and my mother. And we walk from the south province of Rwanda, in the south of Rwanda, until we reach in a country called the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is in the uh, west of Rwanda. If you drive from, from, uh, from the hometown, my hometown to Congo, it's normally seven hours if you drive. But we didn't drive. We walked from the south to the country in the west for more than three weeks. And in my life, I have never walked more than 10 minutes. We have cars that drive us everywhere. But in one second, everything changed. We started walking for days, nights, and evenings. I always tell people that if it was just walking and if you can survive the walk, that would be okay. But the walk we're walking, we spent those three weeks without eating because we couldn't go buy food. They would kill us. The more than three weeks walking, we spent those more than three weeks with no food and we survived from drinking water that we found in the rain when it was raining and we found in the well and we drink that water. In my life, I've never missed breakfast, lunch or dinner before. I was born in a very well family. And one second, no food, walking in the rain at night, evenings. I was tired. I was telling my mother, I'm hungry. I want to eat. I want food. I was asking them, where's my grandma? Where's, where's my brother Shisha? Where's, where's, where's my sister? Why, 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 why are we walking? Why, where's our cars? But my mom, she didn't have time to explain me what, what's going on. I was just four years old. We're walking, no food. But remember, our journey, there's every street, every bush, everywhere we're hiding, there's someone trying to kill us. I saw friends of my family killing people or trying to kill us. I saw kids who are my age when their bodies are on the street. I saw women get raped in front of my eyes. I saw close members of my family, uh, close members of fr friends of my family when they're being killed. And I was asking my mom, why, why are they calling me Tutsi? Why, why are they, where's, where's that, why is that machine is full of blood? Why, why are those people running? And all these questions are pumping to my mother. I didn't know who, who was want to kill me, who didn't want to kill me. I didn't know what Tutsi is or Hutu is. I didn't know if in my country is even called Rwanda. Oh, no food, walking. One day, we were hiding in a place, in the bush. And what they used to do, they used to send dogs, and the dogs would sneak people where they're hiding, and they bring people and go kill them. So we're hiding in the bush, me and my mother, and they found us, and they brought us with other people, so many people, like 300, so many people who are sitting on the ground, where they have correct from different houses, who are waiting to be killed. I was sitting on the last line, like we were a group of people, like, I was sitting on the last line, me and my mother. And my mother, she told me, run and go hide behind 
a bush, which was like a few, meet few meters where we are. So I was really small, so I ran slow by skin and follow. I went hiding in the, in the, hand, in the bush. A few minutes after my mom, she followed me, come, she had to. And a few minutes, they killed all these people in the front of my eyes with machetes. And just, I was just behind the bush. And it was my, one of those people that was, who were being killed. We walk, no food, surviving love, killing everywhere. And I, we keep walking until we reach in the Democratic Republic of Congo in the west, in a small town called Goma. By the time we reached in Congo, I was physically and mentally like dead. Because spending a lot of time without not eating and walking long journey, I was very weak. That my doctor at the hospital when I was told my mother that I was not gonna survive. I recover uh, slow by slow, and uh, one thing, I, one thing is because everything I saw during the genocide, I had a trauma. So I was, I will sit in the place, start screaming, and every time I go to sleep, everything will come back. So I spent so many uh, months I was struggling with my trauma. But slowly by slowly, I get healed. After the genocide, a few weeks after the genocide, my mom came back quickly to find, to find who survived in my family. And she found my sister was three years old. During her journey with my uncle, uh, she lost my uncle during their journey. And she was taken hiding and by a woman who hid her in the well. She spent two months in the well by herself, a three years old girl. We have no idea how she was able to make it. Three years old, two months in the well. My younger brother who was one year old and my grandmother, they didn't make it, they didn't survive. Um, my brother, they took him and beat him on the wall and he separated in two parts and they forced my grandma to drink his blood and, off, off, and also after they killed her, after she was raped. And people who killed my grandma and my younger brother, they, are not, they, they used to live next door to my grandma's house. They were my grandma's neighbors. They were young people in the 20s that my grandma helped to raise. My grandfather, was put in a toilet. Toilet in Africa is different. Toilet in Africa is a long hole. He was put in the toilet alive. And he died weeks and weeks after. Some of my uncles were killed in the massacre in the stadium. Some of them were burned in the house. Some of them we don't know where their bodies even today. The genocide against Tutsi was just 100 days. In a hundred days, we lost more than a million people in my country. And my family lost more than 80 members of my family. This is my story, but there's thousands and thousands of stories of survivors, how they survived the genocide and what went through. My mom told me, hundred days before the genocide, my family was very wealthy, have everything, Hundred days after genocide, my family was one of the poorest family in the world. My mom told me the only thing we had left was only clothes we were wearing. Our house was destroyed, cars, many, everything was gone. And I was left with my sister and my mother and one of my uncle and my dad. After the genocide, I grew up want to know why they are calling me Tutsi, why, where's my grandmother, why they killed them. And as the more I learned about my, the history of my country and the genocide and what was going on, because I didn't know anything was going on in my country when I was just seeing bodies and everybody killing around me, the more I learned about what was going on, the more I hate people. So I grew up with the anger itself in my, inside me and hating people. In school, I was that kid who was very, very quiet and who hate people. 
But until I was 11 years old, that I was learning about people who did great and saved lives during the genocide. And I decided that I want to change. If I want to be different and people kill my country, I need to make a difference. I need to change them. So what can I do to make a difference in my community? I was 12 years old. I found I don't have money. I don't have a PhD or master's. I was not a star. But I found something important I had. I had time. And I decided I'm going to use my time to make a difference in my community, my country, and the world. So I started joining youth organization back home when I was a kid. So I joined every youth organization that was working with young people. And I started working with them. So I used to go volunteering in, you know, with, with organization, orphanage, and try to work with young people. And slow by slow, I started getting involved in it. One person asked me when I was speaking in Canada two years ago, I asked me, why did you go around sharing your story? You know, it's painful. I tell, I tell him, because I believe when people hear my story, they will learn for what happened in my country, and they will make sure it never happened to their community in their countries. And that was my contribution to society, my community. I didn't look, I had so much barrier. I could just sit home and say, I'm, don't have a PhD, don't have a master, don't have a There were so many excuses, but I decided I'm, I'm going to put the excuse down and make a difference and try to do what best I can do. I saw so many young people here, and let me tell you something. You know, you don't need to be rich to make a difference. You don't need to be a star to make a difference. It's just one thing you need to make a choice. And that choice can change lives around the world. Every hero we have in a society, there are people normal like us, born like us. But they did something important. They made a choice to make a difference. And that difference has changed lives, countries. Your choice can change lives. Your choice can make a difference in someone's life. Talking about people who saw doing great work, I'm so proud today to introduce you to General Domer Dalai, who as a career soldier in 1990 was appointed to the first command of the United Nations as his mission to Rwanda. His mission was to observe the ceasefire and peace negotiation known as the Arco, the Arusha Arco. Instead, General Dalai became a witness to the genocide that I survived when I was four years old. We all grew up here in about great men and women, like Nelson Mandela, Dr. King, Mother Teresa, or President Lincoln, and other heroes in our community who were there to achieve what was deemed impossible at the time. Lomel Dell is one of such hero. When the international community was busy trying to avoid any possible way to prevent the genocide in Rwanda, this man made a choice to stay and help. He could have lived like most people, but he made a choice, and a choice to stay and help. When his organization abandoned Rwanda, he decided to stand by her and protect her people. There are the actions I credit to directly saving thousands lives of people in Rwanda. Men and women walking today in the street in Rwanda because one man, born in, uh, one Canadian man, made a choice and that choice has saved their lives. Jeno Dalai is not just an inspiration to Rwanda, he's an inspiration to the world as well. And young people specifically are here. And that show, can show the power of young one person, how much impact can make on life of people. Following the genocide, genocide uh, General Dallaire was appointed a Canadian senator and has raised awareness about the child soldiers' genocide prevention and post-trauma stress disorder suffered by former soldiers. I want to finish by one of my favorite quote about him. He said, 
Go get your goods dirty in the field. Now it's time to take up the cause of the advance of human right for all and the moment is yours to grasp. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming General Dalai. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I, I come from a, a country that uh, you might not even know exists. Uh, because if you ever watch the news, they always have a weatherman there. And when you look at the map that they're using, the map shows the United States, but it doesn't show anything north of the United States. And so I come from a country that usually just gets bad press because we send you a very cold Arctic blast every now and again to ruin your day. I also come from a family uh, that arrived as immigrants in Canada uh, this summer coming 375 years ago uh, in Quebec City where the original land, where they landed, uh, is still in the name of our family. So my mother tongue is French, or Quebecois, which is sort of 18th century French. And I learned English when I went to a cub pack, uh, and uh, the young chap who was in charge decided he was going to teach this guy who didn't know how to speak English, a rhyme. And so I'd like to tell you what this rhyme is uh, because I would use it every now and again when I was asked a question. And the rhyme goes like this. When you're out with your honey and your nose is a runny, don't think it's funny because it's not. <laughs> Now, uh, some of you picked it up very fast, some of you are still working on it. It took me a year and a half to figure that out. This morning is not to be a downer. This morning is to be, on the contrary, you seeing the future positively. Because you are going to shape the future. You are the future. But to set that, I that up, it'd be interesting to know a bit about the past. And so I'm going to go a bit beyond what is normally CNN history, which is what happened last week, and go back about 20 years. To do that, I'm going to ask your participation. So to also make sure that you're awake, I'm going to ask you, every one of you who's under 20 years old, to stand up. Now. Thank you very much. Okay, you sit down. You, you've just had your coffee break. Now, why did I ask you to do that? Because what we're going to be talking about and what we have been talking about may seem like ancient history to you because you weren't even there. You weren't on this earth at the time. But for those who lived it, those who survived it, it's not ancient history, it happened this morning. Because the trauma of the horrors of genocide, of mass atrocities, a massive abuse of human rights stays with you. It stays very, very clearly in your mind. You relive it. There is a corporal who was part of one of the patrols 
near the end of the genocide, they had gone into a village that had been completely wiped out. However, the church was still, the doors were still intact. And so when they went to the church, they realized there were still some people inside. This was very unusual because what the extremists would do is they would tell people, go into the churches because by international convention, you are so protected in churches. And so when the churches were chock-a-block full of people, like we hear, the militias would surround it, throw a couple grenades in, and then proceed systematically to kill the people row after row after row by machete. Mothers would be buying bullets to kill their children versus having them die over days, sometimes by machete wounds. Every church mission became a slaughterhouse. So they're in this village and by some unusual circumstance, the people were still alive in the church. So the sergeant who was in charge of this patrol called my headquarters and he said, General, he said, I've got a couple hundred people here. We gotta get them out of here. We need some trucks. So as he's calling me on the, the radio, from one side of the village, there's about 20 boys and girls, 10, 12, 14, 16, 17. And they've got AK-47s. And they open fire on the sergeant, the patrol, and the people they're protecting. So as he's reeling from that, from the other side of the village, there's about a dozen girls. Some of them are pregnant. They're the same ages, but they're human shields behind which other boys and girls are shooting at the sergeant, the patrol, and the people they're protecting. And so the question is, what does the sergeant do? Doesn't have a two hour lecture, he's got Nanoseconds, the bullets are flying and people are already being hit. What does the sergeant do? So this corporal who was part of that patrol, every now and again, when there's a, well, a gloomy day outside, when somebody might have said something that triggered his memory, or smell even, he is all of a sudden back in Rwanda. He actually hears the sergeant giving the order to fire, to protect. He feels his finger pulling the trigger and the impact of his rifle in his shoulder and he's looking through the sight of the rifle, digitally clear and in slow motion, and he sees the head of a child exploding. How did we end up in such an impossible situation? How did we end up that children, youths, your peers, ended up conducting the bulk of the slaughter in Rwanda? How did they get indoctrinated? How did they get sucked in? What influenced them to do this? How come we couldn't stop them? And they did it for a hundred days. And so as the theme of this morning is, is that for a hundred days, this hysteria was going on and the slaughter was going on day in and day out and nobody came. Nobody was interested. In the first week of that slaughter, many countries sent reconnaissance teams inside to see what they could do. And they would go come by my headquarters and say, to debrief me, and they'd say, General, we're going back 
and we're telling our country not to get involved. Essentially a decision to do nothing, a non-decision. So a decision to do nothing is a decision, of course. And I'd say, well, why, why are you going to recommend that? You can see the bodies, you can hear the fighting, you can see the massive numbers of people being displaced and refugees. And he said, yes, but he said, there's nothing here. There's no strategic resources. No oil or coltan or something that would interest us. It's not in our self-interest to come into this fight. In even the country is not a strategic location. And one representative of a large developed country actually went so far and he said, said, you know, General, he said, the only thing that's here are humans, and there's too many of them anyways, it's overpopulated. The only thing that's here are humans. Yet that did not carry the day. Nobody came. In fact, nearly all the countries, the 26 countries that had provided me with troops, were ordered out. Because about a dozen or so had been killed, and I had about a hundred who were injured. And so the international community decided that the Blue Berets, we couldn't handle casualties. And so we'll pull them out. Remembering, if you've read into or seen the movie Black Hawk Down, what happened in Mogadishu. When those 19 rangers were killed and their bodies dragged through the city, this extraordinary country decided to pull out. And when the world power decides to pull out, it doesn't leave much credibility for the rest of us to stay. And so the world pulled out. And although the Rwandans amongst themselves had lost their sense of humanity, those that were exacting this slaughter, the rest of the world also lost its sense of humanity, as it did before World War II, and even during a large part of World War II with the Jewish community. These people in Rwanda just didn't count. It wasn't worth the risk. And so nobody came. And the slaughter continued, and continued, and continued. And the bodies kept piling, and the dogs and rats became huge. And the smell became impossible to breathe. It would enter the pores of your skin. Because nobody felt that these human beings actually counted. In fact, the result of that is a sort of a question that we could ask ourselves, and the question is, are all humans human? Are we all human? Or are some of us more human than others? Do some of us actually count more in the scale of humanity than others? And so over the last 20 years, we have seen many countries imploding. We've seen failing states. We've seen mass atrocities. We've seen ethnic cleansing. We've even seen genocide. And we've seen that sometimes we will go in to help, and other times we don't. So we've sort of set up a pecking order in humanity by our actions and our inaction. Imagine, we set up a pecking order. Oh, we know there are frictions of some of our differences due to our economic status, ethnicity sometimes, tribalism, religion, power. 
But are we actually in a pecking order of humanity? Can we actually say that those there don't count as much as us? So let me give you an example of how I faced this question. When the rest of the world lost its sense of humanity for that hundred days, when the rest of the world said, we're going to write these people off, they just don't count. Close to 20 years ago these days, finally, the United States and the other major powers decided that these acts of genocide were actually genocide and were giving me the mandate to be able to intervene by giving me the troops I needed to stop the slaughter to get after the bad guys and to stop them in their tracks. So they gave me a mandate for 5,000 troops. However, none came. Even though the UN said, we give you the authority, nobody wanted to come. However, in our sense of optimism, hoping you're coming, we decided that we would start moving people between the lines, remembering that the two groups were fighting and there were people behind their lines who had been caught when the war started. So I had negotiated to get people moving between them. So I'm driving down this road at about this time in what is known as no man's land, where the two fighting forces had separated for a while as they regrouped. So there should be nobody there. But as I'm driving down the road, a couple hundred yards ahead of me, there's a little boy, about six or seven, in the middle of the road. Now, what the extremists were doing is they would take kids, young people, your peers, they would put them on the roads where humanitarian convoys would go by, with food and water and medical supplies, and the children would stay on the road so the convoy would stop. If the children didn't stay there, if the youth didn't stay there, they simply slaughtered them right there. And so the convoy would stop, they'd attack the convoy, steal what they needed, kill the people. 56 Red Cross people were killed in that genocide by emptying even the ambulances in which people were in with big Red Crosses on. So I expected that this young boy up there might be the first of a group to set up an ambush. So I slowed down, I had a couple of soldiers with me, we jumped out, looked around, nobody. So then we went into the huts along the road there to see if there's somebody living there where this child should really not be. And all we found were corpses of people who had been killed weeks beforehand. And as we're looking, we lose the child. We lose the young boy. So we double back and we find them in a hut where there are two adults, and father sort of, and a mother and two other children in there, half eaten by dogs and rats. And he's sitting there as if he's at home. It was his home. So I picked him up and I brought him in front of my vehicle and I looked at him and he was mangy. He was dirty. He had flies all around him. He was in rags. His stomach was bloated. But then I looked into his eyes and what I saw in the eyes of that little boy was exactly what I saw in the eyes of my seven-year-old son when I left Canada to go to Africa. They were the eyes of a human child, and they were exactly the same. That little boy in the middle of that genocide, that civil war, was just as human as my son back home in Canada. There is no difference. We are all equal. We are in an era where that equality goes well beyond the pretentiousness of tolerance, 
We are in an era of respect. For if we respect someone, then that means we treat as equals. And so in this time frame, we have this horrible example of how the world failed, how the world lost its sense of humanity. And as we're looking at it, we can see every now and again other flare-ups. The Congo is still going up. Central African Republic, Mali, Syria, Libya, Myanmar. Even in South America, they're using children in Colombia for the wars in there. There are a lot of places where people in power, the adults, are still abusing their own and in fact destroying the lives of the young people, your peers, by using them as instruments of war and doing mass atrocities that are leading to genocide. And what are we doing about it? What are you doing about it? Where are you in this thing? Are you in your school safe? Are you in your community safe and learning and acquiring skills and knowledge? Living with ethical references, moral sense of values? Are you hung up inside that bubble? Or are you part of humanity? Do you feel you're part of humanity? You particularly in this country who are members of a world power. You have thrust upon you that extraordinary capability but also that incredible responsibility. You are part of the leadership of humanity. And that means you will be, every now and again, called upon with others, but called upon to take difficult decisions. Are you ready to do that? So, I sort of, over the years, felt that the only way you could really sense this is not just by the internet and Googling, And it's not just by the odd event that you might do. And it's not just the classes you might take on what's going on around the world, although they are the stepping stone for this. I believe that we should have a sort of rite of passage for you, either after high school or community college like here or your undergraduate degree. And as Daisy Lee alluded to, you go where 80% of humanity is living in inhuman conditions. We are part of the 20% of the haves. We are actually pretentious enough to say that, hey, humanity is doing well, look, we're preparing to go to Mars. How can we say that when 80% of humanity is living in inhuman conditions in the mud, in the blood, and the rage of that inhumanity. And so the rite of passage should be, you put a few dollars aside, and you go and you go and get your sneakers or your boots dirty, in the lands of those countries that are in development, not the ones that are in fighting now, but where humanity is in inhuman conditions. A couple weeks, a month, a few months. To see, to hear, to feel, to taste, to sense, to bring that sense of humanity to you and come back and under your bed 
should be that pair of sneakers reminding you that you have a mission. You have a mission. You are part of the leadership of humanity and you have a mission. And your mission is never again. Your mission is we don't let the adults keep power, abuse power, destroy human beings, segregate them, separate them, set up a pecking order amongst them and treat them differently because of whatever criteria you want to use from race to creed to religion to gender. That should be abhorrent to you. Oh, and one day you might want to go visit Europe. Well, Europe is always going to be there. So leave that in the backdrop. Go to where humanity is. Get a feel for that humanity. Let it empower you. So we see in your eyes the passion that yes, there's more to us than just us. There is a whole human race out there and we are all equal. All humans are human. Not one of us is more human than the other. And under that principle, we are empowered because we know. We are empowered individually. And imagine when we get together collectively to support the change and to assist, assist in stabilizing those areas where inhuman practices are ongoing. So what does that mean? The first thing it means is become an activist. I don't mean take over the president's office every week. That's what we used to do in the 60s. Become an activist. Get off your butt. Get involved. Feel something in your stomach that you think is worthwhile involving yourself. How do you put that energy, that power, that resource to good use? Join or create a non-government organization, an NGO. They cover the whole spectrum of humanity. The Engineers Without Borders and the uh, Doctors Without Borders and CARE and you, even the UNICEFs and, and Save the Children and World Vision and all those, they, there are thousands of them. And some of them are, are pretty big and fancy and they sort of pretentious. Well, create your own. You can do that by setting up a website and go at it. One day I'm in my office when I was working on Sierra Leone. I'd been in Sierra Leone in 2001. The war was a complete war based on youths, your peers, both sides, the good guys, the bad guys, and it gets difficult to figure out which one is which, were using your peers to fight those wars. And so as I'm back in Ottawa in the office going through the next phase of trying to extract these kids, as I was doing at the time in the field, the door swings open and these three guys walk in and they're about 18. And they got big red noses on. So I said, well, I'm being recruited by the Sikh Soleil. So I looked at them and I said, who are you clowns? Being a general, we're not necessarily always very polite and receptive. And they said, you're right. They said, we're clowns. In fact, we're clowns without borders. I said, what? He said, yes, we're clowns without borders. I said, what do you guys do? He said, we get a few dollars together. 
We go into these refugee camps where there are tens of thousands of your peers. We go into internally displaced camps where there are also tens upon tens of thousands of your peers. And we teach them games. We teach them how to laugh. We help them survive the horrors of living in those inhuman conditions. And so the mandate you have is be an activist, get involved, and in so doing, you will be in the front lines of preventing mass atrocities, abuses of human rights, and ultimately genocide. And that is the lesson that the elders around you are still trying to sort out. We have not found the answer of how to prevent genocide. We're working at it, but it's still ongoing. Central African Republic is going to become a genocide. What is worse now than it was 20 years ago is we didn't have the communications. We didn't know what these things were. We had lost the sense of what had happened 60 years ago. But now we do. And now we have a way of fighting impunity through the International Criminal Court. We have doctrines that will permit us to intervene, to protect human beings. And if we're not doing it now, then we're more guilty today than we were 20 years ago when we are simply caught by surprise and unable to respond and unwilling to take the risks. So that's the message. Become an activist. Be that leader that you are. Join forces if needed. Go get your boots dirty. Come back and change how people see other human beings. And live by a premise that every one of us is equal. Every one of us is human just like the other. That little boy 20 years ago who was just as human as my son. I know where my son is now. What happened to that little boy? Did he survive? And if he did, what happened to him? Where are they now? And was it right that he had to go through not only that experience, but try to survive in order to be a person that might find happiness, love, and maybe meet some of his ambitions. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you have here a screen that says humanitarian intervention in a new world disorder, and where are you? Things are not neat out there. It's complicated and it's ambiguous. We need new minds. We want you to be involved to prevent some of the catastrophic failures that are ongoing today. And I will give you a small example of one of your peers in a city in Winnipeg about five years ago. Did he, I, I gave a presentation at the end, he said, General, he said, he said are there still nuclear weapons? And I, I was caught by surprise, and I said, well, during the Cold War, we had them. But I said, I know, uh, as an example, President Obama is working at reducing them and, and hopefully stopping the proliferation of them so no wackos get some of them and, uh, and maybe eliminate them. He said, well, you know, he said, there are still thousands of them. And he said, I don't know why we're worried about plastic bags and a bit of, of an oil spill or dirty water. He says, because only a dozen of those weapons, if they ever were all launched at the same time, would wipe out the whole surface of the planet. They would wipe out the whole seven billion people. 
And we still have over 20,000 of them. So he said, why are we worried about plastic bags? How come we still have those? And so I went looking at this, and what I found was a pugwash. Pugwash, in fact, is the name of a small little village, fishing village in Nova Scotia, where in 1957, 20 nuclear physicists got together and started the non-proliferation and nuclear disarmament. And it's a movement, it's an NGO, it's on the web. We still meet every year. It's got a whole youth wing of anti-nuclear and anti-proliferation. The thing that bothers me in this is that we, the developed world, have now spent over the last 20 odd years since, as an example, Rwanda, close to $600 billion in modernizing them. And we haven't spent that on either the environment protection, where we need a communion between us and, human and the planet to survive and to thrive, and we haven't spent it on human rights we haven't spent it on prevention of conflicts. We are bicephal. We got two sides to us. We're looking to you to bring this together and to bring some logic to ultimately what is the aim. And the aim is that all humans have the fundamental right to freedom the justice and the right to the respect of being treated equally. And you, all of you, are in the front lines, entering the front lines in the trenches of that new generation in this new era with the communications revolution, with the social media of being able to coalesce like never before and build a power base to influence the policies and the future of humanity. You are the generation without borders. You're already global. You're already on the web. You're, you're doing all kinds of things. You are global. You are real-time global. You soon will be able to Skype or FaceTime anybody in the world. We have never been able to do that in our history. You are mastering it. You're going to lead it. So use it and become the power behind us to make the change where we are still fiddling. Focused, but fiddling. Where you, with those instruments and those revolutionary thinking, and with that activism, and with those dirty boots or sneakers under your bed, you will make the change where all humans will be treated equally. Thank you very much. And to this generation without borders, you absolutely have a mission. Um, please take these words to heart because you are the generation without borders and you are the ones who can make the difference. Today you've heard General Dallaire. Shortly you will be part of a workshop experience. The first way to start making a difference is to take what you heard today and share it with others. Go home, talk to your mom and dad and siblings and others, and let them know about your mission to go out there, be a humanitarian, learn about others, get your boots dirty. Okay, you've learned, you've gained a lot of knowledge this morning. And when we're talking about knowledge, let's think about the opportunity that we have here today. 
We don't often think about our freedom, our access to education, our ability to all of us, for all of us to be here this morning without interruption. We don't have to worry about violence here. We don't have to worry about being kidnapped here. We are very fortunate to have the freedom of education. And there are current events that make us acutely aware of this basic right that is denied in so many places around the world. As we've gathered this morning and we've heard General Dallaire's mission for us, we know that there are girls in Nigeria who are kidnapped, who are held against their will, who are forced to change their religion, and they are facing other certain violations of their human rights and dignity. They need our help. And you, every one of you here, can start today by raising your voice and helping them. Your teachers received cards today that they will give you so you can let our government know that you care and they must help bring back our girls. Please call our government representatives. I know it's hard to believe, but I've been there. They listen, and I guarantee if every one of you, not if, when every one of you calls your congressperson and your senator and lets them know that you care about the girls in Nigeria, you want them safe, and you want them to have the same rights that you do, it will have an impact. They will respond to you. Your voice has great power. Use it. You also have power through social media. We've seen just in these last few weeks how social media finally brought the tragedy in Nigeria to the world's attention. Earlier we said, please turn off your cell phones. Please, please, please turn on your cell phones and sweet about today. You let your followers know what you've learned from General Dallaire. Let them know. And please, you are the generation without borders. When you tweet, your message goes worldwide. It becomes global. Okay, it's your first step. And when you tweet, please use that hashtag. Be the change.